Uh oh. Everybody, this is Kim from Read It Again Bookstore, and today I'm here with Chef Hugh Atchison. Hi, Hugh. Hello. So you have a new book out, and I'll be honest, it's awesome, and we sold out. This is the only copy, and it's mine, and nobody can have it. Um, I will have more in tomorrow. Uh, Hugh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, I'm a displaced Canadian. I live in Athens, Georgia. I run restaurants in Athens and Atlanta. I do a lot of writing and consulting. So this is my fifth or sixth book. Um, and this one really is just about what do you send a kid off to college with or give somebody who really doesn't have much culinary props at all? Like, where do they start? Um, that's, that's just basic and structural and technical, uh, because I just firmly believe that cooking is, uh, like a sequence of blocks and the more blocks you have, the more things you can build. But the technique is really can be atomized down that if you know how to make a vinaigrette, you just know how to make a vinaigrette and you can flavor it with anything. If you know how to roast a chicken, you know how to roast a chicken and then you can do this many things with it. So it's kind of like a Lego set in the way that you build and sustain and nourish yourself by just rearranging of those blocks to come up with new things. I did. I underlined the Lego set thing because I saw that in there. Um, so I'm going to put links to your restaurants in the comments. Um, okay. So you wrote this book for your daughters, right? Well, I wrote it for everybody, but, um, my kids are 16 and 18. And though they grew up with me cooking all the time, watching me and they learned a lot. Um, I think that I wanted to document something that they would go off to college with, at least have a resource of saying, oh, I can make that vinaigrette and I can roast carrots and make a cabbage slaw and, and figure things out. So, you know, I think that life is just so much better when um, people have the ability to nourish themselves. And geez, there's this massive divide between sustenance and nutrition and then nourishment. Nourishment's this implied emotional level of things. And I think that cooking can really provide something akin to much more nourishing. Um, and, you know, if anything good's come out of a pandemic, mm -hmm. there are not that many good things that have come out of this weird time. Um, but people cooking at home more is really been encouraging and really interesting to see. And um, whether they feel like they have to do it now because they don't want to go out, um, that that's fine. Um, but it, it just lends itself to to people getting healthier and figuring things out and mm -hmm. and opening up that culinary wisdom in their mind to to you know it, cooking doesn't have to be expensive it doesn't have to be complex it just needs to be good um one of the things i liked about your book was it well i've seen you say this before um your idea salt that it should be a flavor enhancer instead of like it shouldn't be salty yeah i mean <laughs> It's it, herbs are fresh things typically. Spices are uh, seeds and, and barks and things like that um, that flavor things and should be relatively fresh as well. But of, of within the year, if you bought cumin back in 1996 for that taco party, it's probably stale. Um, and salt is different from those things. Salt is a flavor enhancer and it pulls a liquid out of food and it allows us to taste it more. Um, and it also pulls liquid from our palate and allows us to taste more. So there is a judicious amount of salt that you put in food to maximize flavor. And when you go over that, it's salty. Mm -hmm. Oh, I agree. I, I have a couple of friends who really like salty food and they always complain that I don't put enough, but you know, they can suck it. Um, less, is, less is better for you and you can always add more per plate. So I like your a list for future generations. And you list things like, gosh, uh, learn how to cook for yourself. Wash your hands often. That's really important right now. Uh, don't double dip, but do taste as you cook. And I absolutely love these because it's just a great list of things you should do. 
Yeah, that morphed out of a much longer list that I put on my Instagram account that was mm -hmm. handwritten for my kids. And um, th these are more things that this was the whittled down version, but it, and that was kind of poignant to do a list like that for your kids that, you know, I have two girls and I wanted to defeat this notion that they should just learn girly things. They mm -hmm. should know how to break down a gun and unload one and, you know, use a chainsaw and mm -hmm. you know, unclog a sink. And, but they should also learn how to learn the notion of picking up trash as you're walking down the street, you know, just because nobody else is doesn't mean it's right. Mm -hmm. What do your daughters think of your book? Uh, they really like it. Okay. Yeah, they, they like it a lot. So they're, they're pretty proud of it, and uh, which is good. That fulfills the pride circle because I'm very <laughs> proud of them. Um, I know you doodle a lot. Are, are these your drawings? Yeah, those are my drawings. I wouldn't yeah? say I'm an artist. I'm a doodler. So, but you know, these, these books and every book I've written is like, it's all me. It's all me writing it and it's all me cooking it. And, uh, and all the doodles are mine. Most of all the handwritten stuff is kind of my, my font and how I write. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. So how do you make a cookbook? <laughs> um, you know, the first cookbook we ever written is used as kind of a treatment for how to a new, a different way of, of, of approaching how to pitch a book. I just called some chef friends of mine who had had books written and got the links to their, or the addresses of their and names of their publishing people. And uh, my friend, Rin Allen is a really amazing photographer and uh, designer. She and I put together this 20 page proposal and wrapped them in parchment and hand stitched them and sent them off to eight editors. And it just kind of, was a thing you couldn't ignore on your desk. Mm -hmm. So people opened it up and within a week we had an auction happening for our book, or the rights to the book, uh, which was great. It's not exactly the way I'd recommend everybody do a book uh, or a book proposal, but usually it's just a, some sort of a manuscript to send in or a treatment. Um, and it's just, you know, words on paper uh, from Microsoft Word or whatever. Uh, this was very design oriented, and, but it worked. And um, so we got a long-term deal with Clarkson Potter. And the way you write cookbooks obviously depends on who's writing it. But um, I generally start with a table of contents and I flesh out the concept of the book. And then I begin to write the beginning. And then we start to sort of come up with recipe ideas, make sure there's not too much overlap of um, similar recipes and things like that, or th things similar ones that we pass done in other books. Um, and then we write the recipes as a first draft, and then we go to photography and testing at the same time. So we take pictures and as we cook them, we get to them to the right level, the photographs are taken. Usually we do two shoots a week for like six weeks. Um, then we take notes as we have made those final uh, iterations of the dishes and we go back to Word and we work through the proper assessment of all the recipes now that's tested and we've taken notes on it. Uh, and then I write all the uh, filler narrative and the story stuff and a little different uh, slide ins of, you know, this is a thing about daily life or whatever, or what I think about food, not a put and, and then and then it's built, you know, then we send them the um, manuscript and the photographer keys and the photos. And then we, um, the design department at Clarkson Potter, which is part of Random House, really puts together the book with my sort of voice um, chiming in now and again. But the, the, the design department's great. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a human who's 49 years old and realize that there are many people better and much more qualified than me to design a book. I, I mean, I can have an opinion here and there that'll maybe help and be fun and inspirational, but overall that that's not my domain. Hmm. My son, I had him looking through one of my sons this morning and um, he got really excited. I told him that we were going to cook something from here. He pick out the recipe and then I would supervise. And he got excited because he wants to learn how to cook, but you actually explain things in here, like how to make pasta, how to saute mushrooms, how to poach an egg, like basic stuff that a lot of cookbooks just skip over because they just assume you can cook. 
Yeah, I think that's been, and I, I don't think the, this is a perfect fix of a, of a malaise of American cookery, which is that we do assume that people know how to cook. But as soon as you write my first cookbook, I remember getting comments that there was a cake recipe and it was a pear upside down cake. It's really good and has eggs in it. And somebody commented on some forum or something in a review of the book that it was good, except for the eggshells were difficult to digest. <laughs> and it got me thinking that, geez, wow, um, we, we we set an understanding level of food and, of, and the complexity of food that we understand, but we, sometimes we're setting that based on our own skill sets. And mm -hmm. I, I think that really uh, America just is hopefully getting back into food, but that has really forgotten a lot of skill sets. Um, so there are plenty of people it's applicable that they do not know how to boil water. I thought you were going to say they couldn't figure out how to like fold an egg into something. Oh, no, no, they definitely can't. That, that they were they actually left the eggshells in there. Yeah, yeah. Um, so what is, uh, where is it? Seed Life Skills. Seed Life Skills was another launching point for this book. And that's an initiative I started with a friend of mine about five years ago. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of culminated now, but it's it's a is a program I started to do rewriting home ec curriculum for my school system, the public school system in Athens. Mm -hmm. I was friends with the superintendent at the time, and he was a great guy named Phil Anu. And my daughter had just entered uh, home ec at that time. I guess it was like seven or eight years ago now. Uh, and you know, what she was learning was like how to make red velvet cupcakes from a box and how to, you know, just like dorky stuff that's not applicable to really nourishing yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and so he, Phil was like, well, why don't you write a curriculum? And I was like, I don't really have time. But we actually cobbled something together and it's all based on life skills. It's like, uh, how do what what skills do you need to give to a, you know, 11, 12, 13 year old, so they can get to 18, 19, 20, the more difficult parts of life. If you're suddenly independent and don't have much money, um, how do you get them to that level? And they can move out of the house and be like, I got this. I can do this. It's good. I can, I can cook these basic things and I can go to the store and I can buy healthy stuff that tastes good and is nutritional and is economical. So we wrote that curriculum and it's it's still up on the web and it's been downloaded in like 60 countries around the world. And it's a it's a full on curriculum to install into middle schools, but it's seedlifeskills.org and people can go get it and download it. And there's also ancillary stuff. I put a link. Put a link there. There. Nice. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, um, I heard a story that your daughter made a vinaigrette on her own when she was six years old. Yeah, she was going off to kindergarten and I, I woke up one morning and uh, she was, uh, well, I woke up the first morning of school, um, her, her first morning of school and a lot of bustling in the kitchen at 6 a.m. And she was all dressed and showered and ready to go to school and looked prim and proper. And, and I made this very elaborate salad and was making a side vinaigrette uh, from scratch to go with it in a small mason jar. And, she, you know, it wasn't something I taught her, but she had seen me do it many times that it's a simple ratio. It's three parts oil and one part acid, and then you can flavor it with whatever you want. And the kids are sponges for knowledge and they just pick up everything around them. So um, she was making her own meal to go to go to school. So yeah, very proud. Do they still like to cook? Yeah, they, they still love to cook and I don't think they do it enough. They're both really busy, but uh, I think that the book is somewhat very, very much for them in a lot of ways. And it's to get over that malaise of saying you're too busy. I mean, you know, you can spend half an hour in line waiting for Chick-fil-A. Um, and in that time, you probably could have made two meals for about the same price. What, um, what's your favorite? What's your favorite thing? Thing? Uh, it depends on the season, depends on the time. I mean, it's made... it's Thanksgiving. Uh, well, you know, we're doing much smaller Thanksgivings, hopefully most of us. Um, I heard that there's a, there's a shortage of small turkeys this year, which I think. Yeah, is there is. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, I, in that regard, I'd probably go for something that's not turkey. I would go for a really good chicken. Um, and I love sweet potatoes and I make leek bread pudding usually and mm -hmm. green beans and gravy and. I like oyster pie. 
uh, things like that. Um, so pretty southern, but uh, then rice and yeah, gravy and but pretty simple. And you know, I I think that the good thing about Thanksgiving is you want a good spread, regardless if it's two or twelve people. I think you need that variety, uh, and then you should make a pie because mm-hmm. that's you're comfort supposed- food. Because we all need comfort food right now. That's right. That's right. Um, so, how can we support your restaurants? You know, we're open at five and ten in Athens, and we're open at Empire State South in Midtown Atlanta. Mm-hmm. Um, but we're socially distanced and very safe, and the protocols are in place, and. We think we've got a really smart scenario on our hand of how to deal with this. We're learning more and more about it every day. And I'm asking my people to really be smart on their own accords on what they're doing outside of work so they don't bring it into work, uh, which is most important. But we've got a pretty close relationship with all of our people. And I, I, I trust them immensely to do the right thing. And they're very mature. So you can come to eat, you can get gift certificates online, you can, you know, buy the book, you can do whatever. And, but the best thing to do right now is don't, you know, I'm not asking anyone to support my restaurant unless I truly believe in what we do. But, um, you know, every day since the pandemic started, we've done, you know, hundreds and hundreds of meals for people in need through World Central Kitchen and a local organization called Action Incorporated. Um, you know, we're just doing everything we can to to do our part in this right now and to do it, respond, be responsible and uh, we'll make it. Uh, there's probably about 70 percent of restaurants won't at this juncture. I mean, it's like it's it's a carnage, yeah. but we'll, we'll make it. And uh, we're trying really hard. So, yeah, mm-hmm. do it. Yeah. You know, I at the beginning of the pandemic, I kind of did an Instagram post. And I've got a fairly substantial Instagram following and um, asking if people wanted to pay now for caterings that I would do later and, you know, minimum 12 people and relatively expensive. And we sold a ton of those. So slowly but surely we're doing those like one a week um, over the next two years uh, to get them all done. So that was a really good really idea. idea. Yeah, it it quickly raised definitely enough money for a couple of payrolls or four, so that was good. Wish we could do something like that. It's not like we cater. <laughs> yeah. Just Advanced. Just yeah, go. I mean, I think that yeah, there's some there's something there. Mm-hmm. Uh in even in book world to say, you know, how about we you know the the, the I not to equate it to a record store, but I've got a friend of mine who owns a great record store in Oxford, Mississippi, mm-hmm. uh, called The End of All Music, and David runs it. And David's a great guy. And I had a really good. I did some. This is years ago. I did some, you know, stupid marketing thing where they paid me way too much money for something. Um, and so I called David. and I was like, I'm going to send you a check for five thousand dollars, and I just want you to send me. Um, records that you like that you pick because you've got great taste and you know my eclectic mix and send them me you know 10 a month for as long as the money lasts oh. and so I get these boxes of like 10 to 15 oh. records each month and it was stuff I wouldn't buy for myself or sometimes it was but it just broadened my scope so I think in the same vein you can probably find readers who are really interested in your vantage point. It's why you guys put shelf talkers. You it's know, a, it's a niche market. Book. And yeah. so if they, they're willing to pay you $500 in advance for, you know, a couple of books a month, mm-hmm. um, you know, that, that saves the day for a lot of people. I mean, well, you talk a lot about the importance of substance and feeding not just your body, but yourself. Books are the same way. We're a substance. You, you need yeah. them you need to expand your mind and, and stay on top of things. And the best way to do that is, is not watch TV and read a book. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Do you have a favorite independent bookstore you like to support? Um, Avid Books Avid. in Athens is my local Avid. one, which is yeah. great. I'll put a link to them. Yeah, we're good friends with them. Avid Bookshop. It's also very nice because I'm their best selling author, author since they've been in existence. So that's good. They've sold a ton of my books. That's great. I, I watched an interview of you um, of you last night, and you walked in front of Avid. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. I was like, "That's cool. I know there that I've been there." So, yep. Mm-hmm. It's funny because um, 
Avid and I, uh, Jan and I talk about how um, the families, all the kids that go to UGA, they live where I live. So mm -hmm. we're actually dealing with the same people, just, you know, a different. little distance. Yeah. Apart. Like, like yeah. the parents live here and the kids live by her. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Hugh, for doing this. Um, I will have more books in stock tomorrow because awesome. I had a bunch and they sold out. All I had to say was it's really good and it teaches your kids how to cook and parents are buying them like crazy. So I highly it's recommend really it. It's expensive. It's the least expensive book I've ever put out. It's, yeah, it's, it's 19 99 20 bucks. Yeah, 19 yeah. 99 Yeah. So. And I have stuff. Oh, I, I made a couple recipes. I made the vinaigrette. You talk a lot about vinaigrette. You really like your vinaigrette. I like my vinaigrette, yeah. but I like the idea of getting rid of an entire shopping store aisle that I don't have to go down anymore. Yeah, so I have it in my fridge in a mason jar, and I've been eating it like crazy. And then I also made the, there's a, a yogurt sauce in here I made, um, but I'll admit it, I made the cucumbers too big. And, uh, oh, oh, you do have that. You have a cutting guide in here, which I thought was really interesting. And you doodled it, right? Yep. Where is that? Oh, I don't know where it is. It's in the front. So cuts of carrot. There it is. Yeah. So, I thought that was good. So, and then you talk also about using knives and what else? What you need in your kitchen, how to season, um, the importance of herbs, spices. Yeah. And yeah. My, my book smells really good because I had it in the kitchen while I was cooking. So it smells like olive oil. <laughs> Those are the best books. They're the ones with their well, well, lots of kitchen stains on them. Yes. Yes. Although we don't always take those, but it does mean that they're better. Okay. Anyway, thank you Hugh, for doing this. Um, if you guys are in Athens or Atlanta, I put a list to all of his restaurants. Um, also, we have his book in stock or we will. Um, if you're ever in town, come and stop and see us. We're about an hour away. We have an yeah, author wall. Well. You can sign it. That's awesome. So. All right, guys. Well, thanks again. Thanks, Bye. Kim.